unprecedented numbers of cases in many states. If you remember the last version of the United States map that we showed you, the dark blue was a little further east than it is today. I mean, the truth is that the high case numbers, the level of hospital impact that those Midwest and uh, Western states are beginning to see more and more of is knocking on California's doorsteps and we need to continue to dig in and do what we can to keep that transmission low. Uh, we know that although we're the lighter color at the moment, that these numbers are really going up and going up quickly and that we are truly in the midst of a surge here in California. Next slide. So today's case numbers, 15,329 cases reported today. Uh, remember the last couple of days we've been dealing with weekend, typical weekend lows. We know that often this number is a little bit lower on average because the weekend sort of still being picked up. But the fact that it is um, nearly our highest case number, not quite, but nearly our highest daily case number um, is continued concern. Our seven-day average now over 12,500. Uh, some good news is we continue to do a lot of testing in California, looking for those cases, 283,819 tests reported. That's a one-day high for us. That 14-day test positivity at 5.6%. And on the next slide, we'll show you how that is comparing to prior uh, days. Next slide, please. So our seven-day test positivity of 5.9, 14-day of 5.6. Really, the point to pick up there is that it's trending upwards. When the seven-day is higher than the 14-day, that means that the shorter-term average is higher than the longer, longer term, um, which tells us that things are generally going up. Not news to any of you, but always important to make the point with the data that we have. Uh, if you look closer at the 14-day test positivity, that's the rate that the governor presents on on uh, every Monday, you'll see that we've had in two weeks a 51% increase in test positivity. So you might say, ah, 3.7%, 5.6%, what's the big difference? For us, it's a major difference. That means that, um, you know, instead of uh, you know, just a, a, a small number of people who get tested, testing positive, that that number is going up. And in fact, it's uh, one and a half times greater than it was just two weeks ago. Important statistic because that trend will likely continue upwards. Next slide, please. If you take a closer look at hospitalizations, we often emphasize the case numbers, but really the cases, uh, uh, are concerning in part because they really foreshadow what the impact is going to be on our hospitals. I've told you before, um, we're feeling more and more confident that 12% of today's cases end up hospitalized about two to three weeks later. So remember, this number, 81.3% increase over the last 14 days, 5,844 Californians in the hospital because of COVID, these are based on case numbers from two weeks ago. What was our case number back on November 10th and November 11th? I'll remind you it was around 7,000 cases, actually just below 7,000 cases reported on that day. So this tells us that we're more than double today, that the pressure on our hospitals will continue. And it's not just on our regular hospital beds, but it's on one of the most precious resources we have in healthcare delivery, an intensive care unit bed. We've seen a 57% increase over the last 14 days, currently just under 1,400 Californians in the intensive care units because of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So hospital systems are stretched. We know that I talk to hospital system leaders many times a day to hear how things are going on the ground. So this number has some nuance to it, but remember on the 1st of November, just over 2,500 people hospitalized, 708 in the intensive care units, plenty of room, we've prepared for this, certainly that is still the case, but when you see the numbers more than double in just under three weeks, we're concerned. Um, intensive care unit, um, nearly doubling in that same period of time. And I'll remind you, 
that people are first often admitted to the hospital in a general ward bed, and then as they uh, potentially progressively get worse, they need intensive care unit care. So they're moved from that general ward bed to the intensive care unit. So uh, we talked to you about lagging indicators. Usually hospitals, hospitalizations follow case numbers, and then intensive care unit stays follow um, regular hospital stays uh, in some predictable way somewhere about a week later. Uh, I want to tell you that something we track is hospitals asking us for waivers. And what we mean by that is um, some permission to be able to operate uh, with some additional patients being seen with existing staff. And today we have 175 hospitals across the state operating with a waiver. And some of these in intensive care units in those hospitals are already being pressed to a significant degree. Next slide, please. This is a slide I used uh, last week. Uh, I wanted to bring it out again. It was a slide actually that I created after having uh, a nuts and bolts conversation with my own mother about how she can think about her own risk of getting infected. And I said, look, uh, you got to think about it. It's sort of as a simple math problem, you know, your uh, potential likelihood of getting exposed. So today we know there's just more COVID milling around our communities. It's, uh, it's more prevalent, as we say. You are more likely to get infected with COVID just because it's more available and more around our communities. Even if you behave exactly like you did a month ago, it's just more uh, more prevalent in our community, that duration of exposure. So we often talk to you about having short exposures or short, um, uh, short periods of mixing, that those two things come together and cause you to have increased risk when you have long duration exposures and you're doing things in our communities where we're likely to mix more than usual. So what are some of the protective factors? How do we reduce that overall risk? It's wearing your mask, keeping your face covered as much as you can, especially when you're with people who you're not used to mixing with. That isn't just people that you don't know, uh, strangers in the grocery store or on the bus, but even with people that you're familiar with, you're close to, uh, you, you know, friends and family from afar, it's very important to keep your mask on. Uh, and then this is why we emphasize keeping at least six feet of distance because that distance can reduce the uh, likelihood of getting infected even when you're together uh, for a period of time. So just wanted to use this as another reminder that there are different elements here that we can control. We can reduce our risk. And a reminder that some of the activities that you did a month ago and you said, hey, what's the big deal? I just keep doing them this way. The truth is that even those activities which felt low risk, felt safer a month ago, today are higher risk than many of us realize. Next slide, please. So on to uh, the conversation about tier movement. Uh, we did last Monday, we had an unprecedented number of counties move into from uh, less restrictive to more restrictive tiers. We had a large number, 41 counties in purple as of last Monday. On Friday, we uh, reported that we didn't have any additional county tier movement, but today it's a different story. We've had some counties move from red to purple, others move from orange to red, and the two that had been in yellow have now moved to orange uh, and so in the next slide, you'll see exactly those counties. Next slide, great. Um, counties moving back to purple, um, Calusa, Del Norte, Humboldt, and Lassen. Uh, counties moving back to red are Calaveras, and counties moving back to orange are Alpine and Mariposa. I think some of you may wonder, well, are any counties sort of holding steady and making some progress? We have some counties that actually have met the um, threshold metrics to move uh, move to a less restrictive tier. It's just a couple. Uh, they have only met that uh, threshold for one week, so there's no reported forward movement this week. But just as we've said 
that we pulled the emergency break. We're looking closely at counties across the state. We are still using the full uh, complement of our blueprint and looking if there are any counties that continue to do because of their collective actions and their own impact on the with with transmission to uh, be able to move forward. And if any of those counties emerge, we will certainly update that as part of our tier announcements the next time we do it. Next slide, please. So there's been a lot of conversation about Thanksgiving and holidays and what to do and how seriously we hope all of you take it. And I will start by saying, uh, you know, I, like many of you, are disappointed about how this Thanksgiving will look different from years past. It is, my kids will say, they often quiz, well, what's your favorite holiday and why? And Thanksgiving is it for me. Um, the fun of gathering with loved ones, food is always great. And then football for me, watching uh, tons of football games throughout the day uh, is, is a real treat. But this year it will look different for me and my family, and I'm hoping it will look different for you and yours as well. I think it's necessary to modify or pause our usual traditions to really stop the surge this year. And uh, we're reemphasizing that the safest way to celebrate Thanksgiving this year is at home with members of your household or virtually. Next slide, please. So we, uh, like other states, have really thought hard about how do we communicate to all of you different strategies to have what are frankly hard conversations. I'm an adolescent physician part-time and that's uh, when I did see patients, I really enjoyed giving uh, young people and parents some guidance about how to have hard conversations. And so this is familiar territory. We know it's not easy to say no and it's not easy to say no to loved ones. But as we kind of dig deeper into the pandemic and our response, there's never more important a time than now to use this as an opportunity to let your friends and family know that you're making a decision to reduce transmission and not gather. We know that uh, you know this is one of the first steps that you and others can take to reduce risk and keep your families and communities healthy. And I think it's important to know that it's hard to do this on your own that many of you will likely uh, need some partners in crime, if you will, to talk to other members or people that will likely be turning down a gathering invitation as well and coming together to say that this is the right decision for us and our family and our community. Next slide, please. So just some strategies, and uh, I think it's really important to be clear, uh, saying no, effectively starts with just that, saying no. It's simple, it's direct, and it's clear. It often helps close the door for further negotiations. It shows that you're serious and you've thought about this in a considerable way and that it's an important decision. I think it's important to offer alternatives. I was just having this conversation with my seven-year-old son, Eli. He was asking me after we told him again for the fifth or 10th time, I can't remember which, uh, that my mom, his grandma, isn't gonna be able to join us as she has every other Thanksgiving. And he said, but dad, she's part of our family. How does this make any sense? I thought you said, we just have to keep our mask on when we're outside with people we don't know. And I had a unique chance to explain to him exactly what I tell many, many people that it's not just about uh, being careful around those who you don't know, but because so many times asymptomatic spread happens, that people are pre-symptomatic, that we don't know where others who we trust and believe in are mixing, that it's in, as important to uh, say no even when it comes to the closest people in our families. I'll be honest, Eli, it took a few times to explain it, but I think he did get it. And uh, he understands that part of our strategy is uh, some sh short-term pain, right? De declining an invitation for grandma's really excellent cooking uh, for some confidence that the next 10 Thanksgivings will include her at our table in our house and an opportunity to enjoy that time together. I think it's important to be honest. Uh, excuses are tempting, but they can easily backfire and take time to explain why you think this is the right choice. 
Um, and don't feel pressured to keep the conversation going. I know that uh, my mom, for example, can convince me to uh, talk about the same subject uh, a few different ways and just being really clear that the no is a no and it's important. And I will just say that I know you, you might say, well, geez, I wish I had this a week ago or two weeks ago because people are already coming or we already have plans. It's not too late to make the change. I mean, game time decisions happen all the time. And I think this is an important one for you to consider. Call that audible, make a decision to do something a little different and decide not to gather uh, with as big a group as before and consider doing it with just your household. Next slide, please. So some Thanksgiving dues, these are really repetition for many of the messages we've already made. Celebrate with members of your own household. Um, respectfully say no to anything that makes you uncomfortable, that causes you to gather, even if in fun and exciting ways, in ways that you know might contribute to transmission within that gathering. Um, take advantage of some creative ways to experience remotely. I know we're working to set up a Zoom at my house so that my uh, mom can pop in and out as she wishes. The kids can yell, uh, yell through the computer to have her come and see something they're working on or uh, enjoy dessert and dinner together as well. Make sure to drop off Thanksgiving meals for older loved ones or those with underlying conditions so that they can stay home. I think it's important that we look out for this. Let's not uh, forget that part of the joy is not just sharing the meal, but uh, uh, having the meal and making sure that our loved ones and those we know might be alone have a meal uh, that uh, they can enjoy. And then it's important just to make sure that these precautions remind yourselves, remind others around you that these are the things we have to do to protect our family and friends because we love them. Next slide. So, you know, the other truth is that uh, California enjoys occasionally really warm weather. Uh, this year, I would not say it's really warm, but uh, never did I think I'd get to be a weather uh, forecaster or weather person, but here you go. It looks in California that weather Thursday is certainly going to be mild and even kind of warm with some of the temperatures. Southern California, where I am, will be in the mid-70s with uh, sun throughout most of the southern part of the state. And that gives us an opportunity to really think about being more creative with our Thanksgiving plans. I know that uh, some friends have asked me what they could do and I've suggested, hey, have Thanksgiving lunch instead of dinner. Might be fun, might allow you to add a few other uh, uh, courses or, or uh, menu items to your meal. And also it allows you to do it outside and might allow you to involve some other activities that you don't normally do. I know it breaks from some of our traditions, but often people have Thanksgiving dinner somewhat early, so maybe it isn't a stretch to move it up a couple of hours to two or three o'clock, do it outside. Um, you know, if you're in a part of the state where a heat lamp or some other uh, uh, ability to keep warm allows you to be outside, sweaters, coats, scarves, uh, all a different way to have a different Thanksgiving, but to stop the surge nonetheless. So uh, look at the weather, decide today to do things slightly differently than you'd planned before. Next slide. Want to remind you of our travel advisory. Remember, we put this out just a, a bit ago to remind people that if you do travel into the state or you travel out of the state and then back in, that there's a strong recommendation that you should self-quarantine for 14 days. You may ask why I didn't spend any time with anyone else. I was in and out of a home of some friends that I trust. But this is exactly the point. We know that roughly 40% of people who are infected today in California, across the nation and the globe, are asymptomatic. That means that without knowing that you have COVID, you could easily transmit it. Doesn't mean that you're gonna become sick, doesn't mean that you're gonna need the hospital, but it, it does mean that you become an important protector of those around you, keep your mask on and quarantine if you do come back after any period of time outside of the state so that we can assure you don't spread it to others around you. Next slide. 
So uh, as we close uh, to the end of this presentation, I just want to remind you of these important things we've talked and continue to talk and talk and talk about wearing your mask. Make sure it's with you at all times. You might have that quick grocery store run, get to the car, realize you don't have your mask. Take the extra minute, go get it. Do the right thing to protect yourselves, those other customers, and uh, in, in many ways and mainly the people that work at your grocery store or any place that you're going to frequent. Uh, maintain that physical distance, six feet or more. Wash your hands. Important with the kids who are going to be mixing and touching uh, things. Uh, many kids, even if you're staying at home, you might have the full week off of school. Important to remind kids to wash their hands, cover their cough. All of those things make a difference. Uh, minimize your mixing. We've talked about this quite a bit today. And then never pass up a chance to remind you to get your flu shot if you haven't already. I know clinics and hospital systems in your physician's office or your provider's office near you um, is able and willing and excited, in fact, to get you that flu shot if you haven't gotten it already. Next slide. So, you know, by way of wrapping up, together we can stop the search. There's no doubt we've done it before. We have the tools. As I look at our data day in and day out, I know that we have the tools to make that turnaround. Uh, even though that today's changes will take a little while to take effect, they will take effect and every day we wait to make those changes means that we'll have another day of high cases, another day of pressure on our hospitals. And this is something that we all have agency and responsibility to change. So as these rates of transmission continue to get stronger, I know California will too. So with that, I'll turn it back over and take any questions uh, waiting. Thank you. John Wolfolk, San Jose Mercury News. Hi, Dr. Galley. Hey, John. Uh, could you uh, talk a little bit about, uh, I, I noticed that uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, Marin, and uh, San Mateo counties, uh, no movement there on your, your tiers. And uh, wondering, uh, uh, I think San Francisco actually had uh, feared they might go purple as early as Sunday, and that didn't happen. Do you have any insights as to what's happening in the Bay Area counties that's uh, keeping them uh, kind of islands in the uh, the urban parts of the state, uh, uh, it's not being in that uh, purple restriction area. Yeah, so I, I think each county has a slightly different story. I'll remind you that uh, just a couple weeks ago, San Francisco was in the yellow tier. So let's not make any mistake. They've seen a significant surge in cases. Um, and, and we believe that uh, some of the tools that they put in place will be helpful. And we hope to see them hold steady where they are, but we're fully prepared that they may not. And I, I do think we've seen it from the beginning that certain communities, certain counties uh, do take some of the guidance uh, more to heart than others. And those are exactly the tools that can help us stay not just in red, but to get down farther. I'm not sure exactly if that's what's going on in those counties, because certainly they're surrounded by other counties with similar attention to detail uh, on these uh, COVID uh, precautions that are already in purple. So we'll see, uh, but I do commend them for continuing to sound the alarm, to communicate effectively through their own public health leaders and local leaders, but also community leaders. I think there's a number of healthcare professionals that I know are sounding the alarm in, in and out uh, throughout the Bay Area and in those counties in particular. And that will, of course, make a difference. So, uh, you know, whatever they have there, uh, I hope we can continue to spread that throughout the state, stop this surge, and get people not just to hold steady where they are, but hopefully to see uh, these trends turn around and re begin to reduce as well. Ron Lynn, the Los Angeles Times. Hey, Dr. Galley, thanks for taking our questions. Really appreciate it. I have several quick hit questions for you. Based on the current trends, do you suspect that the average number of daily deaths by Christmas will be wor worse than the greatest peak in the summer? 
the University of Washington's IHME model forecasts a cumulative death toll in California by March to be double what it is now. Do you think that's plausible? Um, LA County is being hit horrifically hard by the pandemic. Do you think some kind of modified stay-at-home order is a prudence for LA County? Finally, do you know whether the surge in Imperial County has begun to require hospital patients to be transferred out of the county and are other counties in this position? Thanks so much, Dr. Galley. Yeah, no, I'll try to try to go through them all uh, uh, as I as I remember them. Um, I think that certainly the numbers of deaths uh, will likely go up, and will likely just as we are exceeding our highest ever numbers of cases uh, and beginning to see our hospital systems pressed with COVID beyond where they've ever been pressed before. Um, the idea that the numbers of deaths could exceed where we've been before is also indeed real and true and part of the reason why we want California to be a state that uh, exercises its alarms, its emergency breaks, well in advance of needing to see the pictures of hospitals that are overwhelmed and death numbers higher than we've ever seen before. And that's part of why we have taken the actions that we've seen and taken already. Um, we also know that just like you're mentioning the various models that have predictions for March, that the models have been proven wrong before because Californians come together to prove them wrong. They do things together, like follow the guidance for not gathering around Thanksgiving, looking for alternatives, making some decisions that we probably have never made before to stop the surge, that those are exactly the things, even if they don't turn things around in the next 10 days, they will certainly be the tools that allow us to turn things around for the beginning of next year and even towards the end of December. So when people ask me about the models and say, what do you think of this model or that model? I would say the model is based on inputs from today, based on our actions that are happening currently, and we have a decision collectively to change those and change the story, change the future of where we might end up. As it relates to Los Angeles, you know, this is where I live, this is where I had worked. I know many of the leaders here are taking this very seriously. They've watched the surge in cases. They've watched the impact on the hospitals in just a small amount of time. I'll tell you statewide, I don't believe we've ever seen as many hospital admissions uh, increased since, like we did just in the past 24 hours. And I hope, but don't expect that it will be the highest we ever have. And LA is dealing with that in real ways now. So I think it's absolutely prudent for the public health and the elected leaders here in this county to be considering what comes next. I think they've put out some clear definitions of what their triggers might be. And uh, I know that it will be important that they discuss that together, give Cal you know Angelino some notice, but really move with the decision so that we can turn this around quickly. And I will tell you, every day matters. We know that regions and states that decide to delay some of these hard decisions end up having more difficulty turning things around. It takes them longer. So I'm certainly sure that they're taking all of this very, very seriously um, across, uh, uh, across uh, LA County. Brian Melly, the Associated Press. Hi, Dr. Galley. Uh, sort of piggybacking on that question, uh, Los Angeles, as you know, exceeded a threshold they had set for issuing a stay-at-home order yesterday, and they are probably discussing that as we speak about whether another stay, well, another stay-at-home order does seem imminent. Why is the situation so much worse in LA? And as the state continues experiencing this surge, what is the likelihood of another stay, statewide stay-at-home order? and what would be the threshold for issuing such an order? You know, I think there's a number of different uh, differences across California's communities. We talk, and the governor says it so eloquently that we don't live in the aggregate here, that even within Los Angeles that I know quite well, we have communities that are really densely populated. We know that there's a number of communities where uh, households are multi-generational. Uh, 
uh, you know, many individuals living together. And we have to acknowledge the role of household transmission. And I want to distinguish household transmission from transmission at gatherings. Gatherings are when disconnected groups, non-household members are coming together. But we also know that a number of essential workers go and they might be infected at work. And then they have, they come home and they do what is a very natural thing. They take off their mask. They take down their guard because where else can you take down your guard if not with your family and loved ones? Those that you share a dinner table with, share a television set with, um, share bathrooms and bedrooms with. Um, those are the individuals that become at risk with an asymptomatic positive COVID uh, individual comes in, spreads it to people within their household. So in Los Angeles, because of some of the unique and um, broad scale characteristics of how our communities are set up, you see a perfect uh, sort of storm of where transmission can occur. And I think that is truly happening. We saw some of that begin with the gatherings around some of these incredible, important celebrations with the Dodgers and the Lakers. And then you have Halloween and you have the, the um, sort of movement with holidays coming up. And, and so it's not really surprising to see in a place as densely populated as as LA with some of its unique factors and characteristics um, to see this kind of transmission. But I think the next set of actions are gonna be important. Statewide, of course, we're watching the same things. We are trying to be thoughtful and um, more targeted with our approaches. We know that a number of communities and people are fatigued and tired. We wanna make sure that any actions we recommend um, really allow us to do the things that are low risk um, without as many limitations while limiting things that are higher risk that we know even though we miss them and want to be doing those activities, we should do without to get this under control. So as I've said previously, we're looking all at that data all the time, multiple times a day, always uh, looking to see when our data runs for cases are gonna come in so we can share, uh, think about that information, share it uh, broadly and make thoughtful decisions, maybe not statewide only, but regionally as well. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Hey, Secretary Galley, uh, a, a two-pronged question for you. Um, you sort of touched on part of it. Uh, uh, California's tier system is supposed to help control the spread, yet, as you just talked about, we're continually hearing all kinds of warning signs that hospitals are filling up and cases are growing. So can you just walk us through, is California's tier system working as expected and help us square sort of some of what's going on with the case counts rising? Um, and then the other prong of that question is, one thing we're hearing from the public health community is California still has a lot of work to do on masks. So, does the state need perhaps a stronger enforcement stance on, on the mask issue in particular? Yeah, no, thanks, Angela, for both of those questions. So, you know, we always, and we said this on the very first presentation of the county, uh, the tier system or our blueprint for a safer economy, we said clearly what the rules are for moving a county forward what they would be when a county needs to move backwards. And then in the condition where data, and we've seen this before, we know COVID goes from zero to 60 very, very fast, that we had this emergency break option and we would move counties back uh, faster than typical um, in the blueprint. And so that's what we did. Uh, certainly, we all wanna keep close ties on the data, on the conditions, and so, uh, you know, uh, there's no perfect system under COVID. We are continually working to improve our systems, but we believe using that emergency break function was an important uh, uh, thing to do. We think that it's available in California in ways that many states don't have that option. Often a state is waiting until they can clearly show how hospitals are overwhelmed, how st hospital staff are um, you know having difficulty being at all of the shifts that they're asked to cover. Um, and we're in California, uh, we have a tool in the blueprint and in our ways of working with our counties to sound that emergency 
alarm pull that break sooner than in other states. And I think that's in part because we've socialized our blueprint, people are familiar with our tiers, and they can understand how we continue to use them to be targeted, yes, but to be decisive as well, especially because decisive actions are exactly what's going to help us stay in front of uh, the situation with uh, with the uh, uh, with with COVID. Kenny Chow, KPIX. Dr. Galley, thank you for taking our questions. I was taking a look at some of the numbers recently on the DPH website, and it indicated that were that there were about uh, 1,500 ICU patients uh, due to COVID. I know you've updated those numbers, but um, it also indicated that there were about 2,100 or so ICU beds available right now in the state of California. So I'm doing just a, some quick math. That means there's a total of about 3,600 total ICU beds in the state. Um, it's my understanding that back in March, there were more, there were somewhere around 7,300 beds total in the state. So how is DPH determining the number of total um, hospital beds? And then why, why are we seeing that such a big difference between 7,300 back in March versus about 3,600 right now? Yeah, so a, a couple of things. Remember, we have always talked about our healthcare delivery system, not just to be available for COVID. If COVID was the only thing that they had to worry about, we'd be in a different conversation but we continue to see people who have heart attacks or strokes who are having emergency surgery and need to be in the ICU. So when you take the collection of need and covering that need, and I, as, as, and, and I commend our hospital leaders for constantly saying, we need to deliver care to all Californians, not just those with COVID. You see at this moment that we are continuing to deliver that care in its fullest extent possible. Back in March, many health systems preemptively uh, canceled some surgeries. We encouraged people to stay home, and some people stayed home when they needed emergency care. We don't want to see that happen again. So we, um, of course, are very cognizant of our capacity, that we know where things stand, not just statewide, but frankly, county by county, community by community, hospital system by hospital system, to make sure that they have what they need to take care of the increasing number of COVID positive patients, as well as the patients with other healthcare needs. Um, we do know that we can bring on additional beds, um, not, not infinitely so, but many more than we have today because of our efforts to plan around surge. We have spaces identified in certain facilities that can be brought on that with additional ventilators and other equipment uh, and with the right staffing. And I often uh, want to point out the staffing because they are often the rate limiting step. We need to protect our healthcare staff, make sure that they're healthy and supported so they can continue to provide the heroic care that they do for COVID positive patients and others so that we can uh, continue to increase our bed capacity as needed. Um, and then we have our alternative care sites, which are poised and ready to be stood up. Uh, some are uh, actually being mobilized now so that we are able to meet the demand uh, for patients throughout our healthcare delivery system. So the numbers aren't an apples to apples comparison between March and now because of some of the factors I've mentioned. And rest assured, we are constantly doing what we can to not just ask people to uh, consider modifying their behaviors to reduce transmission, but to take care on the other hand of the people who need care now within our hospital systems. And we will continue to partner with leaders across the state to make sure we can do exactly that. Anna Abara, Cal Matters. Hey, Dr. Gally. Um, I wanted to follow up on what you and the governor shared yesterday about vaccines. So we know it'll be a while uh, longer before vaccines are available to the general public. But wondering when that happens, you know, how much are vaccines going to cost, including for people who are uninsured? Um, second, will health workers be mandated to receive vaccine? And three, can you talk a bit about how exactly manufacturers are deciding how many doses a state gets? Is that just based on population? Thanks. 
Yeah, I mean, really all, all excellent questions. Um, you know, currently uh, there is no consideration at the state level to require healthcare workers to get the vaccine. I think we have a lot to learn about the vaccine. We continue to evaluate it and really try to understand it. So at this point, uh, that is not a decision that is being moved forward. Uh, in terms of the cost of the vaccination, uh, you know, like so many essential things here in California, we're working with our insurance uh, partners and vendors to make sure that it's covered and fully covered, that for those who are uninsured and those in the Medicaid program, they should rest assured that that's a place where the state is going to step in and support to make sure that the cost of vaccination in no way gets in the way of someone's decision to be vaccinated uh, more than ever, but with so much health care. We, uh, preventative care, we make this decision, and this is a very, very important one. As it relates to the allocation strategies from the federal government and the manufacturers throughout different states, uh, as far as I know, it's likely going to be done based on uh, state conditions led by our population and our size. So California should get uh, a, a significant and even the highest amount of vaccination based on those distribution plans, but we, I don't yet have a firm, a firm picture of what that looks like. And remember, the timing is going to be important. Not each of these vaccines is going to come out at the same time. We aren't sure. We know that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, although distributed very differently, different logistical considerations, they may be on a closer to the same timeline than, let's say, the AstraZeneca vaccination, which was announced just yesterday to be quite effective as well. Kevin Stark, KQED. Thank you, doctor. Another vaccine question for you, and this one on distribution. Can you clarify who in California is designated as an essential worker in terms of distribution? We have examples, but is, is there a list of workers who qualify? Um, we're hearing some confusion about if teachers will be considered essential or not. Yeah, so I, I think the first order of business for us is determining that 1A priority group, which is largely going to be focused on the healthcare space, uh, individuals who work on our healthcare front lines, uh, and in, in some of our congregate care facilities. So then in the later uh, priority groups, we'll be discussing other non-healthcare essential workers as well as uh, the uh, individuals who are vulnerable, often living in our congregate care facilities, as those initial groups to get uh, to, to be prioritized and to receive vaccine uh, or the option to be vaccinated. We expect that some of those decisions will be made over the course of the next many weeks after we get through that priority group 1A, and then will be posted to our website, uh, uh, you know, after all of the right conversations with our drafting guidelines work group, uh, assimilation and working with our uh, community advisory group as well to make all of that public. But stay tuned. I think it's uh, certainly a high priority, but the first order of business is to get that initial group set up, clarified, and we'll be doing that in the next many days. Spencer Custodio, Voice of OC. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks for taking our questions. Mine's kind of specific to the Southern California region. Um, now that the state's kind of had you know, some time to look at the new cases coming in in, in uh, this part of the state. Are you able to kind of pinpoint where, you know, the new transmission is coming from? Is Was it, uh, you know, it's just for instance, like shopping malls, is it private gatherings, um, you know, indoor or outdoor restaurants? And then to also kind of follow up with something you said earlier, uh, you said, you know, the approach may not be statewide only, but regional as well. And I was just wondering, you know, is there um, potential uh so say if Los Angeles does a stay-at-home order, would there be a potential for the state to come in and say, uh, you know what, Southern California, you know, the surrounding county, San Bernardino, Orange County, San Diego, and whatnot, they will also be under some type of stay-at-home order to kind of prevent travel um, from one county to the next. 
Yeah, Spencer, uh, good questions. I think at the moment, as it goes to pinpointing transmission, we continue to hear from uh, different counties, different things. They all mention that private gatherings is a important source of transmission, but not the only, and sometimes not even pinpointed as the highest source of transmission. Some mention gatherings in restaurants. Um, in general, what we know is anytime you get together, with individuals where your guard comes down, your mask comes off, you are closer than a few feet apart, there's a risk of transmission. And because of asymptomatic spread and the reality that most people who have COVID may not know it, you create a real risk. And I think, so in Southern California and throughout the state, as those activities increase, we know that you're gonna see transmission. And the hardest part, I think, for many people, and I've talked to some young people who have said, you know, they didn't know they were infected and they worried they caused a loved one, an older loved one who's vulnerable to become infected. And that's absolutely a possibility for many of us and why we've urged you to take some extra precautions during the weeks to come while we uh, approach the period of normal family and community and friend celebrations to do those things. So I can't put, put my finger on the exact source of transmission. I know everybody would like me to be able to say, or any of us to be able to say, it's this and not this. Um, the truth is because of the way that people gather, any activity that allows for us to take our guard down essentially is going to become a potential transmission risk and a hotspot for transmission if it happens at scale in a specific county. With regards to the second question you asked, um, you, you know, I think it's important that we communicate that back in March, we didn't have many tools in our toolbox. We didn't have the ability to think in a more targeted way, to apply some of our decisions in a targeted way. What the blueprint does in part is allow us to be targeted even in neighboring counties. But absolutely, another way to be targeted is rather than say we're doing something statewide, but apply it in a certain set of counties that happen to be geographically near one another. So I don't want to say that that's exactly where the plan would go, but certainly in, uh, in a period where we want to have all possibilities on the table, that we want to be targeted so that we apply these things in an effective way, but not too broadly. Uh, certainly, certain things that you mentioned could be part of the plan, but currently that is not where we've uh, certainly uh, had conversations with those leaders in Southern California about doing. Kevin Yamamura, Politico. Hi, Dr. Galley. Um, I want to ask, uh, even in Purple Tier, you've allowed schools that are open to stay open. And I'm curious, as a doctor and the state's top health official, where you stand on school reopening and where the balance lies between minimizing risk to staff and ensuring student social, academic, and emotional health. And I have, I have another question related, which is whether you've sent your own kids back to school, and if not, whether you would send them back. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I think great questions. I'm going to start with the second one. So my youngest one, who's not uh, uh, K through 12 aged yet, she does attend a child care center down the block from my house. I have good conversations with the people who operate that center, feel confident that they're doing the, you know, following our guidelines and uh, really reducing the risk, not just to my, my own child, but to all the families and the staff. Uh, and I'm very concerned and want to make sure that we do the right things for the staff. Uh, my other three children are in a school district that only offers distance learning options, and so they're working through that. I have a seven-year-old who's in first grade, a fifth grader, and a seventh grader, and they're all having their own trials and tribulations and getting through it in, in uh, different parts of the house with dueling Zoom, courses and people popping in and out. So, you know, they, they've become accustomed, but I don't have the opportunity yet to be able to send those three to in-person education. But if the chance afforded us to do that, we would, because I believe that schools have uh, many tools available uh, to potentially be able to do that. But 
I would urge us to continue to look at how we keep our teachers and our staff and other staff at the school protected. We know that there are tools. We've provided a number of those tools. And uh, uh, I'm always interested to talk to a specific district or a set of districts about how we can create the lowest risk environment so that in-person uh, learning can happen. But I will end by saying that this is a local decision that I think the characteristics of each community are important to take into account. And by taking those characteristics into account, crafting a unique approach, probably using many of the same principles that all schools will use, but making sure that they're applied in a local and unique way creates a more comfortable situation and allowing us to have all of the tools like PPE and masks, making sure we follow many of the guidances that we put out, keeping things outdoors, making sure that we keep cohorts together so there isn't a great deal of sort of cross-classroom mixing, and making sure that those with underlying conditions or other health vulnerabilities are uh, protected uh, even above and beyond. So all of these tools give me confidence that working together we can create lower risk environments in schools and uh, you know, keep those that are open, open now and look forward down the road as we uh, continue to bring down case numbers or as we look forward to bringing down case numbers to creating more paths to, uh, uh, to address the concerns of our school community and make sure when the time is right that we uh, bring kids back as much as possible. Final question, Claudia Fischweta, KNX News Radio. Hey, uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, when you talk about the alternative care sites, I'm wondering where the state would get staffing for them if we start to see severe shortages throughout the state and then, you know, perhaps can't bring in people from other states because they're going through their own surges and shortages. Second question, um, since you live in L.A. County, you know there's been a lot of back and forth on suspending outdoor dining at restaurants and critics saying that, you know, if you do that, you're going to just penalize the restaurants that are following the rules to prevent the spread and you're going to drive up, uh, you know, at home indoor gatherings and just make things worse. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And then um, just to follow up on the earlier question on mask enforcement, the art the argument I keep hearing against that sort of thing is, you know, we can't go after everyone who ignores the rules. We need to focus on cooperation, stuff like that. But it seems like if people started getting tickets for not wearing masks, that a lot more people might comply. So I'm wondering why not try that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for reminding me. I know sometimes because we get more than one question at a time, I miss a few and I'll come back to one other about Imperial County in a minute. So thank you for reminding me of uh, what I think was uh, Angela Hart's other question. Uh, so uh, certainly the question about outdoor dining is an important one. And as I said before, uh, you know, there isn't a single place where spread happens, but there's characteristics of activities where spread is more likely. And, uh, you know, outdoor dining, uh, because it often happens with no mask, often bringing together people who maybe haven't seen each other in a while in close quarters, become concerning for spread. It is not the only area where I would be concerned, but I think that it's an important place to constantly look. Uh, the notion that potentially by uh, limiting outdoor dining options that you'll just push people indoors. Of course, we hope that that doesn't happen. We did with our limited stay-at-home order, not just limit public places or pro you know businesses, but we also said between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. that uh, household gatherings really shouldn't happen and that we hope people will make the decision, the decision not just for themselves, but for their communities to um, not have those sort of gatherings for the next many weeks as we try to bring down these case numbers. As it relates to uh, the masking question, remember the mask uh, order, uh, the statewide mask order is, is indeed uh, enforceable that some local jurisdictions have decided to provide exactly that, do fines. 
Uh, I'm not certain myself how many there are that are doing that and what their impact is, but that is an option on the table for locals to uh, enforce. And, but as you have said, with all of public health and where we as public health leaders really lean on is that it is about education and cooperation first. And we hope that so much of the message, hopefully not just delivered by me, but delivered by you and your pens and what you write and what you communicate as well can help break through to a number of people who maybe said, you know, this isn't for me, but now maybe I'll do it for a little while to contribute to my own communities and reduce the spread. With a particular call out to young people, we often have called them the young and invincible. They're the ones who, uh, frankly, uh, don't feel like they need to wear the mask, feel like they're protected from COVID, and they may be right. Even if they were infected, uh, they might not get sick, but the fact that they might get people in their community sick or people in their household sick, uh, I think is an important warning, and that's why I emphasize that 40% asymptomatic uh, statistic up to 40%. If that's really the case, uh, and we believe that it is, it's important that we remind young people the importance of wearing a mask. So again, continuing to beat the drum of education, information, and uh, you know, delivering that strong message, but also recognizing that local officials, uh, some have already expressed it, but can uh, certainly use a fine, a ticket, or some other enforcement opportunity. Before we wrap up, I'll just uh, uh, end with, I know Samba, one person asked a question that I failed to answer right away about Imperial County. And certainly we are watching those numbers closely. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I believe that uh, on a routine basis, the hospitals in Imperial County do occasionally have to transfer patients out of their county for care. I'm not sure. I don't believe that if it has happened at all, it's happened to a significant degree as of yet, but it is certainly what we are concerned about and watching closely. Sorry, before we go, getting uh, one question to clarify. Certainly, I think, uh, as we always, I'm asked to clarify uh, what has been gathering guidance and Thanksgiving guidance from uh, health officials in Los Angeles County. As we've always said, our statewide guidance uh, is uh, what, where, where we expect the state to um, take account, except when local guidance is more restrictive. And so in the case of gatherings, where uh, a health official and the guidance is to not gather outside of your household as uh, the guidance is in Los Angeles, that we at the state um, will say that those in the county, so in the county of Los Angeles, should sure, certainly be following the guidance from the local county health official, in this great place, Dr. Barbara Ferrer and uh, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, that if their guidance is more restrictive, that that is indeed the guidance that should be applied in LA County. We at the state um, have the unique responsibility and task to identify guidance that works statewide when it's applied statewide and counties themselves as they have for years and years, decades and decades, had the ability to be more restrictive than even the state. And if that's the case, as it, uh, as it is here in LA County, that those are the guidance that should be followed. So with that, I know we, we went for a full hour. I'm grateful for your attention, for your questions, and helping me do a bit more to clarify our message. Um, you know, in a period of thanks and this holiday, yes, indeed, my favorite of them all. Part of the reason why it's my favorite is it's an opportunity to um, count our blessings, to be thankful for so much um, uh, that we have. And although this year is an unusual one, uh, I think we are thankful to be in a place like California, in a place that is working hard to be led by the science and the data 
And even though it means some short-term hardship and sacrifices, we believe that it's going to help us hold on to the gains that we've already had and really get through the rest of this pandemic in a strong way. And with that, I hope uh, that as you decide how to gather, how to celebrate your Thanksgiving, that you do it with your household, do it safely, uh, have as much enjoyment and peace as you can. And I look forward to seeing you, if not later this week, early next week. Take care.